So we're officially starting the webinar now. Um, so welcome everybody with this webinar that is uh, organized by the IFRC uh, European uh, Regional Office and hosted by the Reference Center for Psychosocial Support. And today's topic is caring for staff volunteers. And this is the program of the day. We have a short welcome. Last time we asked everybody for an individual welcome, but uh, it turned out we had a lot more participants than we had anticipated. Um, today it's a bit smaller crowd, I think, but maybe there will be more to join. So we've just decided to ask people to introduce themselves in the chat box. And then there's more time for interaction later during the Q&A, the questions and answers. Um, a warm welcome from uh, our end, so the Reference Centre for Psychosocial Support. My name is Anouk Bosma, I'm a Mental Health and Psychosocial Support Technical Advisor with the Reference Centre for Psychosocial Support. And I am joined by two colleagues, one uh, who is sitting in the Copenhagen office, uh, Eya Susanna Akasha. Eya, can you quickly introduce yourself? I'm just starting the video here. Uh, hello, everybody. I know a lot of you and it's so I'm so glad to see you on today. And uh, my job today will be to follow the chat. So do write, do just put a lot of comments. So I will interrupt and say, oh, there are these very good questions coming up in the chat. So that is my role. Um, and Anouk will, will host the webinar. So that's all from my side, except you asked me to introduce myself. And I'm also a technical advisor at the center. Perfect, thank you. And then another colleague who is currently still in Budapest, if I'm not mistaken, but on her way to Albania. Birte, could you introduce yourself quickly? Yes, good morning, everybody. Uh, as Sanuk said, my name is Birte and I'm a PSS delegate. Uh, and I'm currently working with the, the Europe office, regional office in Budapest, on my way to Albania. Thank you. And we have a few more colleagues uh, joining us to present and they'll present themselves as they start their presentation. Um, but first of all, as a sort of icebreaker, perhaps, um, but also just to get everybody in the right mood for the caring for staff and volunteers, because obviously caring for staff and volunteers starts with yourself. A little exercise that will be done by my colleague, Ea. Ea, do you want to take over? Um, but can I also say a bit about why we do this? Yes, please. Go okay, ahead. so today I'd like just to talk very briefly about what we usually talk about. We talk about stress and then we talk about stress and then we talk about stress and then we say take care of yourself. So let's look a bit at the hormones that is behind all this. So I have titled this stress and kindness and you may worry, wonder about the kindness, but it's related to de-stress. So Usually, as you know, we have these two systems in the body. One that is acting like a speeder, which is you're gonna do the webinar, then you're a bit worried, which is the, the fight or flight system. And recently there's been a lot of research into what we would call then the break, which is all about rest, calm, relaxation, restoration. These two systems need to be balanced, we know that. And um, interestingly enough, the, the hormones and the transmitter, um, um, uh, transmitters that are neurotransmitters that are in both are very, very old, meaning that they have a very significant place in the organism. And in a little while, we're gonna do an exercise. And this is when I need you to take out your pencil. So please get it ready. I'm gonna continue though. So when we, this is what I'm talking about now is relevant also for when we do care for staff and volunteers. So we go a bit to the scientific basis of it. And there's a big group of researchers, especially Norway, who did a lot of research doctorates in the oxytocin that we're talking about in a little while. So if you think about it, you have stress and then you have the rest relaxation system. You can also say you have the kindness system and I will get back to that. So what happens is that when we're under stress, blood pressure goes up, the immune system goes down, the, um, what is it here? The heart rate goes up. Um, the presenters can probably feel it the first minutes they're talking. Um, we have a higher risk of having inflammations. We are at risk of um, having depressions, stress release depressions. And then we also, it's also infects our relationships because we are 
you know how it is. We are incontinent with our emotions. We are short of temper and we're not very pleasant to be around. Um, but whereas the rest and relaxation system, the oxytocin, the hormone and, and neurotransmitter that oxytocin acts as, actually makes us nicer people to be around. So it decreases blood pressure. Our immune system is boosted. We have a lower heart rate, so we're not that worried and, and anxious that we will have a heart attack and a panic attack. The risk of inflammation goes down, and as you can see, the we the mood improves. Um, it's not only it's it's like, it's like an antidepressant actually, and then you have uh, relationships that become better because we're actually nicer people to be around. So, when all this came out some time back, it was um, the oxytocin that was then named the love hormone. This is in fact wrong, but it, this is because when you have this flood of oxytocin, it was studied because you had um, a flooding of it when, when children were born and it, when, 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 when women and, and animals are giving um, are breastfeeding their children, but it's also really released during lovemaking. So this is why it was called the love hormone, but actually it's more of an attachment hormone and it's more a hormone that builds social relationships and it is released in a lot of different ways that we will talk about that we can use when we care for staff and volunteers. So if you go to the research, it actually shows that if you are having, lot, having good levels of oxytocin, and uh, then you will be more friendly, open, and you will be more sensitive, interested in others. You will have um, actually a, a better view of the world you will grow mentally and you will easier recover after distressing events. So actually the basic, the basic line here is, or the baseline is that high levels of oxytocin, they do promote trust. It is shown in a lot of research that, that you would always, after having been touched, you would have a higher degree of trust in others, kindness. And this is why I titled this presentation, Stress and Kindness, um, Wellbeing and, and General Lower Level of Stress. And, and in these times of distress, let's use the, the research and let's use the, um, what we know. So what promotes the, ox the flow of oxytocin? And that is actually, as you can see here, it's different kind of touch. This is where we're deprived now. So you may know that a lot of people have actually bought pets and they bought dogs and it's impossible to get a pet in many countries because actually this is what is good for us to be around humans or to touch something that is human-like and um, different kind of touch can also be what we're going to do today and we're going to do a very old exercise from from um, from psychomotor therapy it's skin touch skin touch contact with others um, so if you have, if you're living with others, it is nice to cuddle. In the beginning, when um, when the um, coronavirus epidemic and we were all in lockdown, and I was living with um, not not a partner but with um, an adult person, and and this person would sometimes when I say, oh, I'm so stressed, this person would come and and do this touch, and it really felt very nice. But what is interesting is that it also is released when you have online conversations. And um, so it's having relations both online and offline. So keeping in touch, one of the things we do recommend in all our materials is actually also good for the oxytocin. And then finally, a thing that um, when I was um, reading up on oxytocin recently again, I discovered that it's also about being attached to places. So it's also about having um, your home as a nice place and, and making the, the um, um, what do we call them, making the um, branches nice where people meet and engage so that they feel attached. This will lower their level of oxytocin. So you may know Joe Pruitt, one of our colleagues who's written extensively about sense of place. And, and um, we talk a lot about this and so psychosocial support. And, and you know the feeling once you're home and you enter the door and you say, oh, finally I'm home. This is actually also part of the oxytocin release. So we're going to do this short exercise because I'm going to, what, what is going to be elaborated more in the presentations we have is that one, what we can do to help people 
have higher levels of oxytocin and will de de decrease their stress. It's also if you as a manager, you are kind and inclusive. Um, because we know that oxytocin is released when people are kind and nice on the phone, for instance. If you're met with a nice voice when you do remote PFA, if the manager when doing online meetings is nice and talks and, and looks at you. Um, when you have social connections, and this is why we recommend very often to have the camera on. Now you can see me, you can see Alpha. We're gonna, you, we, we see the, need to see the presenters. And it's all about when you're online and when you do online meetings, wave, use these signs so that you use what we know decreases oxytocin, which is also doing singing together. You know, in many countries, people are singing together from the balconies uh, or in the mornings. Um, this is part of this release. And when you create this feeling of togetherness, when you do online yoga, stretches, meditation, when you help others and um, so this is what you can stress when talking to the volunteers have skin and and touch humor and laughter even though it's a serious situation we all know humor is a very good antidote to stress and then of course proper relaxation and now we're going to try it let me see to my notes and i can share my notes if there's anything yeah 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 okay no, I have covered what I wanted to cover. So take your pencil and hold on to the lead end and I'm gonna show you what you're gonna do. It's basic, basic. And you can use what works even better than a pencil um, is actual bamboo stick. So this is what we do in psychomotor therapy. So take up the other hand and then you, you're just gonna gently, 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 gently activate the skin. Oxytocin is released by the skin contact. And you can do that yourself. Now you're activating all the skin cells. We have a lot of sensorial, and especially in the, in the, um, in the hands. You, know, you may know if you have a medical background, psychological background that, can you feel the, the hand is becoming alive? Go on a bit longer. <sighs> and you may notice that I released a sigh. I didn't do it on purpose. I just felt it coming. That is because we are having this flow, rest and relaxation also. Parasympathetic, parasympathetic system is activated, which is what we want to do. I noticed my shoulders just dropped a bit. So did you touch all parts of your hand? Maybe also the nails, that's unusual. <laughs> I see Kona and Elfa on the, this is really so nice to see you. It really is pleasurable. Okay, that's it. So just sit for a moment and, and compare the two hands. How does the hand that you worked with, how does that feel compared to the other one? Could I have one or two of you say a word? I'm unmuting you. Can you feel it? Elfa is nodding. Anybody else, can you feel it? Yeah, somebody else is nodding okay so um i'm gonna explain that what we usually do um now you can all unmute yourself if you want to um you can you can do these kind of exercises you can for instance work on half of your head you can have a tennis ball you can have anything and this will makes you more relaxed the more you do it the the better the effect but this was just a small exercise. So once in a while you can do little exercises. Each Friday we have a relaxation exercise, breathing exercise on our Facebook page and we can send them to you. There will be more um, for the rest of the year. So that's the end of my uh, introduction and exercise. Over to you, Anouk. Thank you, Aya, for making us all relax already in the early days of, of today. Uh, let me share my screen again. I just wanna go quickly back to the program. Nice. 
Um, so as you can see now in the program, we will continue with our colleague from um, Despina. Uh, Despina, would you, if your audio allows you, can you please introduce yourself? Yes, and I hope you can also not only hear me, but also see me. Um, my name is Despina Constantinides, and um, I am an MHPSS uh, delegate uh, uh, that I work for Danish Red Cross, but also uh, currently I'm seconded to the IFRC to support uh, in developing uh, COVID-19 related material. Uh, so, um, I will start, if, if I can, Anouk, uh, share my screen. Yes, you can. And please inform me if you can see it. It is starting, yes. Okay. You can put it in presentation mode if you want. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So what, what I'm trying to do um, in my presentation is just to get uh, our colleagues uh, who are working with the Red Cross, Red Cross and societies, or whoever is also uh, joining us from other organizations, to get familiar with some of the tools that uh, the uh, PS Center has developed. Um, and just to understand what, uh, what do these tools mean and uh, uh, how can they uh, act. So usually when we talk about uh, volunteers and staff support, uh, we hear a lot of terminologies within the Red Cross like peer support, body systems, uh, supportive supervision, and uh, sometimes also we get confused in which material uh, to use when we, uh, uh, when we need to do something actually practical uh, for the staff and volunteers. I'm assuming that all our participants today, like uh, they can contribute in, uh, in, to these systems, either by uh, being a supportive peer or being a team leader or being uh, a manager or in a, in a managerial uh, position. So uh, we will give some idea about um, the management considerations and leadership skills. Just a second, because I see Anouk. Um, before an emergency situation or during and after. And, and currently when we say before, we mean like at the beginning of COVID-19 because we didn't have a uh, long time to prepare uh, for COVID-19 specifically, but uh, some of our national societies were prepared for any emergency uh, situation. Uh, we're gonna talk more about what is peer support and body systems, what is supportive supervision and uh, the referral systems and where can we find the tools for each one of them. And we will, at the end of the presentation, talk a bit about uh, the monitoring and evaluation tools. Please feel free because I know that uh, we're, uh, uh, we had to get used to uh, training and presenting uh, let's say uh, remotely, but I'm still a kind of person who likes to interact with the participants. So I'm a little bit challenged uh, all the time. I still didn't get used to the system. So please feel free if you have questions, if you need to interrupt me, uh, to write in the chat box and uh, and can, I will help me uh, to respond to your questions or feedback. Um, so when we're talking about management and leadership, um, we're talking about uh, different things that we can do uh, before or during or after an emergency. Um, when we say that we're prepared, uh, this means that we were able to, um, let's say, um, uh, train our colleagues uh, on capacity building and uh, on a PFA, psychological first aid, for example, which is the most important uh, training material that we have within the Red Cross or even within all the humanitarian response. Um, that helps um, our colleagues to respond to an emergency situation. We're talking about capacity building related to self-care because regardless of all the systems that, that we build as, as organizations, uh, the, the key thing is our, our self-care or how can staff and volunteers take care of themselves because no matter, no matter what kind of services we're offered, if, we're not, if we don't feel the responsibility for our own well-being, uh, then no matter what is offered is not helpful. 
uh, sometimes also like um, uh, if when if we refer during the emergency to just just to make sure that uh, we have a clear description of tasks. I think one of the main things that we suffered as as humanitarian responders at the beginning of this emergency is that we were really lost. Like what can we do? can what can we done? How could it be done? Um, um, are we are we all on the same page of of uh, what kind of responses needs to be taken? What should we prioritize? So sometimes if we don't get our clear, uh, our, our, our task clearly described to us, at least if we can be proactive to, uh, to clarify these tasks for, our, uh, for ourselves with uh, our line managers. Um, is everything okay so far? Yes. Okay. Fine. We can hear you very well. Um, and um, of course, we need to discuss what kind of support systems uh, available. Because uh, um, in some organizations, we have some support system that is in place, but during emergency, we, we, we sometimes forget uh, that we can use, actually these systems are in place just to be used right now. Um, so, um, and uh, of course, provide the basic needs for our staff and volunteers. Uh, uh, to be able to respond to the emergencies. We know that, that during this emergency, we have some staff and volunteers who were first responders who had to be in contact with the beneficiaries, uh, but also we have um, uh, others who are working from home, but at least to make sure that if we want people to work from home, then they need to have the equipments uh, that can help them to work from home. And if they're working in the field, at least they have uh, personal protection equipments and they can, uh, uh, and get the material, have the material and tools they, uh, they need. Okay, my, my screen is stuck for a, for a reason, however. It takes, it takes a little while on Zoom uh, to go from one slide to the other, but it was moving. Okay. So these, the, I, I just give, gave uh, a brief, a brief, um, I alluded to what can, what are the managerial considerations or leadership considerations, you can, if you want to call it, um, during or before or after a, an emergency situation. However, that the reference center <clears throat> has specifically developed um, um, this document, which is the key actions on caring for volunteers in COVID-19, mental health and psychosocial considerations. And of course, um, um, even if we're saying volunteers, it doesn't mean that it doesn't apply on staff because um, uh, in the Red Cross, we even uh, consider ourselves as uh, staff to be, to be volunteers as well. So if you want more information about what to do, you have this uh, key document that is on the PS Center uh, website. The other terminology that, we, are there any questions so far, comments? Okay. We, we don't I, have anything in the chat box. I think people are really listening to you. So please continue, it's fascinating, okay. thanks. Um, the other terminology that, terminology that we keep hearing is peer support. And peer support is is uh, like it's um, it it comes in different forms. Uh, let's say um, we can talk about uh, like the group setting uh, of peer support. And I always in, like keep saying, even if our organization does not put these systems in place, uh, if we want to be responsible for our own well-being then we can also encourage, like do these, uh, any benefit from these systems or create these uh, systems within our inner circle or smaller, a small circle. So um, there are uh, different uh, modalities, which is, for example, the groups of uh, peer support. And when we say peer support, we're assuming that people are at the same level, no one is, is, uh, is more specialized than the other, uh, where they can uh, virtually um, um, have regular meetings where they can discuss challenges, dis discuss concerns, discuss um, uh, all the you know, uh, difficulties that, uh, that, they, uh, that they encounter, but also it, it, it helps in normalizing uh, how I feel. So I remember at the beginning of this emergency where my colleagues 
and I, of course, we're trying to adjust uh, to working remotely and working from home and not having an office and, and not having these regular chit chats with, with each other. Um, it was important for, for all of us to discuss and say, you know what, I'm not working fully eight hours a day because I can't concentrate like continuously without being interrupted with small chit chats here and there the way I used to have it at the office. So the, these group, uh, group uh, meetings um, are very helpful uh, in emergencies. So uh, it, it, it helps the, the, the staff and volunteers feel that they, uh, that they are normal human being. they are beings, they are having normal reactions of their concerns, it's not only their concerns, it's the concerns of all the staff and volunteers experiencing the same emergency. Uh, what's really important in, in, in peer support if we want to have it as a system uh, within our national society or organization, it's that it should be on a voluntary basis. In some um, countries, we have witnessed that um, the selection criteria that there, like that when we're talking about group peer support, there was um, like one or two persons who are, um, let's say, designated to be the peer supporters. And this required, of course, that they, uh, they have the proper training, which is like psychological first aid skills, communication skills. Um, one of the mistakes that we used to witness is that um, the peer supporters were selected by the organization. And what we always, we, we always try to encourage that the, the peer supported, supporters should be elected by their peers. Um, because usually if, if you allow the peers to um, select who they would like to be their main supporter, um, it's, it's by default, it means by default that this person has communication skills and, and is respected by his or her uh, peers. Uh, another, another system is the body system. And again, if our organization doesn't have it, then we can have it. It's, uh, it's uh, simply like two colleagues together um, decide to be each other's buddies. And um, um, again, it should be voluntary that I, uh, I need to vol vol like voluntarily uh, choose my, my body system, my body, my body I mean. And it's mainly just to follow up on each other, um, how we're doing during the day, and um, uh, just checking in on each other. Uh, and we have the, um, a podcast at the, um, um, with the reference center about the body system, so you can also access it if you want to hear more about how it works. Uh, another modality is supportive supervision. And it either happens on an individual level or a group level or even live supervision. What do we mean by that? Uh, is that um, we're expecting that someone is more experienced in, in, uh, in MHPSS uh, modalities where can, uh, who can uh, um, discuss us individual concerns of uh, staff and volunteers. Uh, sometimes uh, these people can be externally uh, contracted by the organization um, who are specialized and can uh, support staff and volunteers um, on more depth level. Um, or it can be done in a group setting uh, where uh, the main components of supportive supervision is uh, allow learning uh, among, um, um, uh, let's say, among peers and staff. And uh, so it includes learning, it includes teaching, it includes support uh, in general. And if you wanna, if you wanna try to understand the difference between supportive supervision on a group level and peer support on a group level, it's, it's just the, the, the depth of the supervision. Like with the peer support, we're peers. We're at the same level. 
So we discuss our, uh, our concerns, we discuss our challenges, successes, and so on. But um, uh, if, it is, if the same supervision is done by someone who is uh, with MHPSS background, then you can go more into depth about how, how the beneficiaries, working with the beneficiaries is really affecting you or uh, how does the, the group dynamics work and why, why, why the dynamics are the way they are uh, within uh, the team. Uh, and live supervision is where, um, where the supervisor can, um, can watch a video of, uh, of a session that is done or an activity that is implemented by the staff and volunteer and give feedback. And it's different than management, uh, to be honest, because if, if I am a supervisor and I'm, I'm, I'm providing supervision uh, and not a supportive supervisor, it, my, my, my responsibility is to be a team leader or a supervisor. Maybe I'll focus more on the management of the activity. Uh, um, are we on time with beneficiaries? Um, uh, are we uh, making beneficiaries uh, participate within the activity or not? But when, you, when it is provided by supportive supervision, it focuses more on how um, we are affected by these activities or what kind of reactions do we have and, uh, and so on. So I hope it's clear for everyone the difference between supportive supervision and the supervision that is done by our line uh, managers. If we don't have any questions or comments, and I will there, there's a there are very there's a very interesting uh, set of comments um, and also on the the body system I just wanted to say and this is ear speaking um, there's been a that um, developing the body systems has been proven to be quite interesting and there's actually um, I found some research that was very very supportive of what we're doing when we have body systems because it actually turns out that people who have body systems in place over longer time, they are much more relaxed and they dare to speak up. And a lot of um, disasters that has happened where responders have failed abominably were because they were not comfortable in speaking up. So um, this is a very good point to underline the body systems. And, and funnily enough, I have mentioned before, but in the recent uh, psychosocial support in emergencies training, we have developed a system where there's a body check-in morning, noon, and with different questions. And this is what comes out as the best part of the exercise uh, of, of, the, of a five-day training, actually, because um, it, it shows how important it is that we build relationships and we feel comfortable in them, that we can speak up and that we can plan together and that we can challenge each other. So groups that do have body systems, they actually much more prone. And if we teach people to do the check-in while they're working, they also avoid making these mistakes. So uh, on, as you go, you ask, you know, are we doing the right thing if you're in the midst of a very, very large scale emergency? So that was just to say that. But Kuhn had um, another uh, um, experience with body systems. And before I hand Kuhn the word, I'd like to say that Kuhn also said um, when he was uh, thinking about something you mentioned earlier, that um, a good way to ask if people understand the task when you talk about how the task needs to be clearly defined is to ask them to explain what it is they do. That they understood. Yes. yes, because very often you have this uh, power imbalance. Somebody is more in power and then it's, it's difficult to speak up and say, oh, I didn't quite get it. So let me ask uh, Kuhn, would you say a bit about your experiences with the body system? Um, hello, I hope you can hear me. Um... We hear you, and let me say this is Kuhn from Belgian Red Cross. I'm sorry I didn't say that. Um, well, um, I have tried in the past to set up a formal body system uh, where one person was connected to another person. Um, they, of course, could choose who they wanted. But um, I have left that idea, um, and we focus now more on awareness and creating a climate of uh, taking care for each other, because they're all um, 
carers and they're very good in taking care of one another. So I, uh, we try to enhance uh, this uh, sensitivity. Um, we also have a self-care plan. Uh, it's two pages where they have to think about how they will look after themselves. And there they can write the name down of somebody. They can discuss with a buddy. But it's not a form. It's not written down. It's uh, not something we have administration with. It's just you make sure you have your buddy. It's your responsibility. Um, but AI, your comment made me think to integrate the buddy system in the trainings. and it, like the morning, uh, noon, at the end of the day. Uh, so maybe that's a way to make a, to make it work. So. Yeah, I'd be happy to share because we have actually developed with actually with the um, with the police in Denmark. Mm -hmm. um, because I was on a mission with um, somebody from the police forces, and uh, with them I was inspired, and I developed something that I'd be happy to share where there are questions for each of these check-ins and you can adapt it. And I think your two pages is also really nice because it's about planning that there's somebody you will contact should you need it. And Numi has a wonderful mm -hmm. contact. Numi is uh, with Danish Red Cross in Niger. And she writes, I'm still in contact with my buddy I met during the PSS and emergencies training in Copenhagen in February 18. We check in regularly. Wow, that's amazing. So back to you, Despin, after these comments, please go on. Unmute, Un and Despin, unmute. There. At the bottom of your screen, you have to unmute, your, you're unmuted, you're, you're muted. Okay, it's because I was trying to share part of my screen and this is when things got complicated. Um, yes, actually, it's very interesting to hear and I was going to also refer to Cohen when I talk about the monitoring and evaluation uh, tools that the, uh, the reference center has uh, developed. Um, and again, like it's really simple to have a body. It's uh, very helpful to have a body and um, it's really crucial. Uh, to take responsibility and have our own uh, uh, our own bodies. Uh, there is something else that I wanted to say, but I don't know. Uh, it just uh, maybe I can add I something uh, to this. I, I thought uh, that we did this exercise in the PSS and emergencies training, and I, I thought it was such an interesting exercise. Then I translated it in a training that we did in Congo, and initially people felt a bit uneasy. They didn't really feel like doing the exercise. It, they really had to get into the habit of doing it. And initially I felt like I was forcing them to have a buddy and it didn't feel right. So it wasn't feeling very voluntary. Um, but uh, at the end of the training, they really got into the habit of doing this three times a day. And even some issues popped up that their buddies came forward and said, well, my buddy has this issue. Can we look into this? So um, just to add, as, as we're moving on to your part of the presentation, just been about monitoring no, no, evaluation. No, that's excellent. No, that's excellent. As I said, I don't like to have a monologue and just uh, listen to myself, <laughs> you know, so that's, uh, that's really helpful. Um, I just wanted to, yeah, now I remembered what I wanted to say. It's about uh, putting these systems in place. Uh, and I'm not talking about the, the, the body system. I mean, we know in emergencies at the beginning, uh, and at the beginning, uh, it's really important to have uh, regular meetings, uh, briefings before, I mean, if, if our colleagues are frontline workers and they need to go to the field to have to, briefings and before they go to the field and the debriefings after they come from the field. Um, but sometimes what we forget as, as leaders or supervisors uh, is to, uh, is to uh, revise our plan. Because it is, uh, it's very important at the beginning to have, for example, weekly meetings, weekly staff meetings, daily check-ins. Yani one of the 
the tools that we use with our colleagues is just to send a message in the morning that you're okay on, on a, uh, a WhatsApp group, uh, especially that we were concerned for uh, each other's health uh, to be infected by COVID-19. So we asked this, um, we, we, we agreed that every day, every morning we'll start our day by sending a check-in message just to say that we're okay, our beloved ones are okay and uh, nothing to worry about. Uh, but what we do forget is that after a while, like we need to revise the frequency of, of these um, uh, systems that we put in place. Is it still, still really necessary to have a one, um, uh, this, this daily check-in or should, be, should it be once a week or should we have the, um, the meetings on a weekly basis or bi-weekly? Um, because you don't want also people to be exhausted with all the systems are, that are in, uh, in place. So this is one of the things that I really wanted to highlight, uh, how, how often should we revise our plans uh, uh, when we do uh, want to have uh, support to the staff and volunteers. I move to the last uh, component of my presentation today, and it's only just to introduce you to the tools of the Reference Center in relation to the monitoring and evaluation. Uh, tools. Um, um, the Reference Center has um, um, developed um, a document called a Monitoring and Evaluation for MHPSS in COVID-19. And part of this document, you will find um, as some um, examples of output indicators and uh, outcome indicators that are related or relevant to staff and uh, peer support. And one of the tools um, that are really um, highlighted in, in this document, and uh, um, you can also uh, see the uh, podcast of uh, our, our colleague uh, um, uh, 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 Cohen, who just has uh, helped us uh, or had uh, some uh, input uh, uh, just now, um, where, where he describes what they did in Belgian Red Cross um, as part of, uh, as a tool to uh, measure the well-being of uh, the staff and volunteers. Because Cohen, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I just want to simplify it. Like uh, uh, what, they, what they did is just that they developed a small questionnaire, bi-weekly questionnaire that they sent to the uh, staff and volunteers on their, on their emails uh, where they had to fill a very simple survey to check on their well-being. And if, um, if any, uh, any of the answers were um, uh, alarming, um, uh, psychosocial uh, trained teams uh, try to follow up with, uh, uh, with the staff and volunteers uh, who are of concern uh, to see why they are feeling this way, what can be done, and uh, how can they be supported. Um, if you need more to have more tools about uh, or, or examples of um, like what is the volunteers comp competency check? How can you have a tool for that? How you can have a tool for uh, training evaluation? Um, what kind of staff and volunteer care surveys? You can always go back to the IFRC monitoring and evaluation form, the framework for psychosocial support interventions. Of course, you will need to modify and adapt, but at least it gives you some inspiration uh, of what kind of questions uh, can you have uh, in the tools that you want to uh, you want to use. Um, if you want to know more about the peer support, you have the caring for staff and volunteers in crisis. Uh, and the toolkit for caring uh, for uh, volunteers. Um, I mentioned the key actions on caring for volunteers in COVID-19, but also there is a document about supportive supervision during COVID-19. So I try to keep in the presentation some of the references that you can go back to if you need it, uh, more information. And uh, of course, uh, what I think we all believe in the Red Cross, one of the main, main tools to use is training uh, staff and volunteers on psychological first aid. And yes, it is our amb ambition that everyone will be trained on psychological first aid. 
because um, psychological first aid just teaches people how they can be supportive. If it was trained properly, it gives the staff and volunteers all they need, all what they need. The communication skills, what kind of reactions uh, do people have during emergencies? Are these interactions normal? Uh, if if uh, when they when do they become critical? How can uh, we? Um, not only recognize stress among uh, ourselves, but also uh, among beneficiaries. Um, what can we do to help ourselves as self-care, but also how can we communicate with uh, people of concern with, uh, uh, in a supportive manner. And these skills we can use with our colleagues, we can use with our uh, managers, even leaders, or even uh, people who uh, we serve. Um, there is the fourteen-day well-being, uh, fourteen-day well-being day, which is also on the resource uh, center website. And it's mainly for people who are under quarantine, either staff or volunteers. And I think it was mentioned uh, during this. Uh, uh, webinar today, uh, where uh, you can put you you can have a plan for yourself for the fourteen days of the quarantine, just to feel that you're productive and that you have plans and you can achieve. It helps you, uh, let's say, cope with the with uh, with the quarantine. Of course, as staff and volunteers were also at risk uh, of quarantine, but not only because we are uh, infected but it's also because um, many of our colleagues had to go back to their countries and it's mandatory if you're traveling from one country to, other, to another to be in a 14 days uh, quarantine. So just to pay attention, not only for people who are infected, but also for people who are under quarantine for different uh, reasons. Thank you, Aya and Anouk. Um, I don't know how... Uh, I um, Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Anouk will take over in a while. I'll just give you a very nice um, thing that came up. It is from Chaim, who is from the Magen David Adom in Israel, the, the National Society of Israel, who says that the idea of asking a question about whether people are tired of volunteering or psychosocial support is very important. So I think um, what Kuhn has told us and what is also um, mentioned by him is, is really very, very good that we, we get a chance to follow up and we can ask this very open question. So thank you for that. And Despina, I think that we should, maybe there will be more questions and, and Chaim can maybe contribute in the, dis in the discussion that comes up after the next presentations. So Chaim, please be prepared to say something if you would. Thank you, Despina, yes, from definitely. my side. And I think, yeah, and I think also my colleagues now uh, will give uh, uh, more concrete examples of how their national society are really responding to staff and volunteers in their national societies. Exactly. Thank you so much, Despina. That was so helpful, that overview. And exactly, it would be very nice to now have two examples. Last week's uh, webinar, we had examples in the European region from uh, roughly west and east of Europe, Portugal and Kyrgyzstan. Um, and I think uh, they are on the, today's call as well as participants. And today we have uh, the Ukrainian Red Cross Society and the Iceland uh, Red Cross Society. And we'll start with Yulia from the Ukrainian Red Cross Society. Um, Yulia, are you able to share your screen? You have to unmute yourself. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I will. So uh, can I start? Yes, and please, I haven't introduced yourself, so if you could please introduce yourself. All right, so everybody, uh, hello again. My name is Yulia Yushchenko. I'm the head of uh, PSS uh, unit of Ukrainian Red Cross Society HQ. Uh, and today I will present what we have, what we had, and what we are having now uh, in terms of caring of staff and volunteers in the Ukrainian Red Cross Society. So uh, I will share my screen. Please tell me if it's seen or not. Can you see? Yes, we can see it. All right, so I then will start. Uh, I will start briefly with uh, explanation of what is Ukraine for those who are not familiar with my country and also what we have in the Ukrainian Red Cross Society. So uh, Ukraine is the second largest country in Europe apart from the Russian uh, Federation European part and it has uh, more than 44 million people uh, of population 
That's not I'm um, showing off. That's just to give you an image, a new image of what we're working with. So from 2014, we have an enrolling conflict on the east, and due to that, we have more than one and a half million of IDPs and around six hundred thousand of demobilized service and veterans and their families. Uh, that's what about Ukraine. Uh, what about Ukrainian Red Cross Society? Uh, it's a transitional society, so we are now in the process of reforming, and it's also is important issue to give you just to understand the context. So we have 24 regional branches and uh, 268 local branches, uh, which is an uh, inheritance from the Soviet era. Uh, and uh, what we have about the capacity of volunteers is around 3,000 volunteers and approximately 500 of staff. Uh, it seems like it's a lot, but actually uh, last time on the NPS forum we talked to Alpha, who's presenting next, and uh, she told us about the number of volunteers they have. And so to reach the same amount of uh, volunteers per thousand of population, we need to have around half a million people, and we have only 3,000. So what about uh, PSS in Ukraine and Russian society? Uh, it was defined as a strategic activity, and now it's uh, under development from 2018. So it's a strategic uh, area, activity. It has been under development for only two years by now. Uh, it's, uh, the PSS has been implemented in 10 regions of Ukraine and is financially supported by Danish Red Cross project. I will talk a bit about it later. Uh, what we had by the end of December 2019 is 162 PSS volunteers, those who are uh, meeting the requirements of PSS profile, they have been trained, they're 18 plus, and so on and so on. We have 15 PSS or PFA trainers. Uh, I will talk about the training system later also. Um, the, the staff capacity is four people in the HQ, me and three of my colleagues, and also nine PSS officers on the local level, uh, one in each region. And what we also have is an expert group, which consists of eight uh, beautiful ladies who are either staff or proficient volunteers or trainers and can bring their expertise to the uh, development of PSS in Ukrainian Cross Society. So this is Ukraine, in case you haven't seen it yet. So the yellow parts are those where the PSS was provided by the end of 2019. Unfortunately, I can't guarantee that it actually is still ongoing in the same regions now because um, a few of the regions highlighted hasn't uh, been supported financially in this year. And even if they try to do something volunteer basis, absolutely with no financial support from HQ or from the government side, uh, due to the quarantine and coronavirus, um, all that was stopped. And uh, I need to analyze it a bit more, but I can guarantee that the capacity of PSS was significantly dropped in a few, like two, three regions out of them. So in 2019, uh, we had more than two, uh, almost 21,000 of individual beneficiaries received PSS by more than 3,000 of PSS events. Uh, and it was, as you can see, 52 towns, cities and villages where PSS was taking place. Uh, so in terms of uh, the systematic approach of Canadian volunteers and staff, uh, what we do on the stage of recruitment, training and onboarding is that um, we have 10 profiles of volunteers with written requirements like the age, the, um, the desirable background, the experience, the required trainings to become the volunteer. For PSS is 18 plus. In some cases, it may be 21 plus uh, year old. It's uh, desirable is a background in social work or psychology, but it's not necessary. Uh, for all volunteers to become a volunteer of Ukrainian Red Cross Society, they have to pass through induction course, the first ACE training, and while it's desirable, and that's what we're working on, is basic PFA, eight hours for all staff and volunteers. 
if a person wants to become a PSS volunteer, then he or she has to pass through the PSS basic training, which is our adaptation of community-based PSS five-day training of the PSS Reference Center. It was a huge job because providing five days trainings for such a number of people uh, in 24 regions is really costly, so we had to adapt it. And now we have eight hour basic training, which consists of basic knowledge and skills on stress, uh, crisis events, uh, just the ethical principles of PFA, as we have PFA in other training, and also uh, some skills on conducting group activities and caring for volunteers, surely. Uh, that's what about the training system for PSS volunteers. Uh, so when the person becomes a volunteer, uh, what then we try to provide him or her with? Um, we have the support groups, but uh, the challenge we're facing is that in Ukraine, there is a high level of mental health stigma. So everything with a psycho in it considers as something uh, as a therapy as if you're doing something that has psycho in it it means that you're weak it means uh, so actually the understanding of the importance of caring of your own mental health uh, is really low so uh, support groups is not really common people do not come to them as uh, they can see the, um, the purpose of it. Uh, so it's just really, really a rare thing. Uh, what is more popular is a kind of informal meetings, which basically is the same support group, but more like with a tea, a coffee, some, uh, so it has no particular structure as a support group. It's more like discussing, it's more like a peer support actually, but a group one. Uh, and these informal meetings are spread through all the regions and all the branches, so uh, that's nothing we can, you know, have an influence or impact on, because uh, people do not consider this as a PSS, even though it is. Uh, apart from support groups and informal meetings, what we can provide is additional trainings, like PFA for children or person can become a PFA trainer, PFA instructor, or if, it, if a person wants to change the direction, they can change the profile and then get additional trainings. Uh, in terms of m &E, how we check on the well-being of volunteers, it's first of all, it's biannual, semi-annual uh, online surveys uh, based on the m &E toolbox uh, the Federation pro provided us with. And also we conduct a focus group discussion with volunteers and staff. Uh, they're conducted by HQ staff during each and every monitoring visit to the field. Uh, what's more, we have a feedback boxes, which uh, can be used, they are anonymous. And also we have the email address where volunteers can text and give their feedback on their performance and their experience in work process. That's what about the support during the delivery of PSS activities or any activities. Um, what the challenges we face? Um, mostly, it's as I mentioned, it's about the understanding of importance of mental health and psychosocial support. The other challenge here is also that in Ukraine, the psychologists are not licensed. Uh, basically, it means that everybody can uh, say they're a psychologist, even like finishing some courses, whatever, and say, oh, well, now I'm a psychologist, please come, I'll help you. Uh, and there is no government control on the quality of services provided. So, for example, for us, it's a challenge to, uh, it's a challenging to setting up the referral system for volunteers, as we can't guarantee the quality of the service that might be provided for them if we refer them somewhere. The second challenge we have is a systematic approach. Uh, as I said previously, the numbers I gave you is not to show off, but just uh, could you imagine the providing the care of staff and volunteers in 2,068 branches? 
it's absolutely impossible to be absolutely everywhere and to check on volunteers everywhere even though we're trying our best uh, again if we're talking about the systematic approach of trainings it's hard to get uh, all volunteers in all the branches around the Ukraine to pass through the particular trainings um, approximate like the average number of volunteer in the local branch is like three to five and if one person come it's impossible to provide a training for one person it's absolutely not a cost efficient it like in the efforts and the output is not could be could be compared so this is a problem this is a challenge we're working on uh, and the next thing that I wanted to talk about is actually the emergency we faced and uh, the, the COVID-19, what we've done. Um, I will start with what we did and I will end my presentation with what the COVID-19 actually brought to us because it was a great possibility to see where we have gaps and try to, to cover them. So what we did is we put the high priority to coordination and there is discussion with volunteers. So as uh, as been said, like before and after the crisis, um, that was disseminated with all volunteers, all volunteer leaders, the instruction how to do that before and after, and kind of reminder to do so. Uh, we started the support in chats. Sorry, there is a typo and group video calls. And what was nice to see that. Uh, the volunteers expressed their will to participate in PSS groups, which they didn't express before the COVID. Um, and we purchased 300 psychological counseling services uh, in the Kiev uh, Institute of Psychology and Psychotherapy. And that's what we're sharing now is the importance of uh, asking for professional help. It's absolutely confidential and even anonymous if I'm not mistaken uh, but by now it's not really popular we spent only 20 of services out of 30 for two months so as I said the mental health stigma is not allowing people to ask for help when they don't need it and we adapt the guidelines of parent of staff and volunteers during COVID-19 in Ukrainian and disseminated it to the all branches and all volunteer leaders so just to sum up what we uh, thought from the COVID-19 experience and what our plans for developing the PSS and caring for staff and volunteers. Uh, first of all, uh, the COVID-19 and the quarantine as in Ukraine there were a total lockdown uh, really raised up the image PSS issues and people are talking about that they need PSS and that asking for help is not so weak as they thought and more and more psychological services are provided in Ukraine and it's a high demand and uh, so that's, that's a nice thing that people are getting conscious about their mental health. Uh, the second one is PSS now is included in almost each and every program and project that URCS has provided and as well along with the uh, caring of staff and volunteers component which is great that the even in branches, even in level H HQ or local level, people are understanding, staff as well just understanding the importance. So it's also a bit challenging because the capacity of my unit is not so um, not so high to cover all the need and all the project with pieces component. So we're trying to develop. And uh, the demand on PFA trainings raised a lot, um, especially for PFA in uh, COVID-19, the remote PFA. And we are now started um, the strategic uh, plan to teach every volunteer and staff in Ukrainian Red Cross Society till the end of the year uh, with PFA, uh, remote, at least remote PFA, PFA uh, in COVID-19. Uh, so that's actually all from my side. I hope that I find it was 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Julia. We are a little bit behind on the agenda, but that's fine. I think we uh, took some of the Q&A time before during Despina's presentation as well. Thank yeah. you, this was very interesting. And um, yeah, uh, from my end, I'd like to, to, to echo what you're saying as well and saying that uh, COVID-19 has brought mental health psychosocial support really to the limelight. But at the same time, it's quite difficult still, even among staff and volunteers to talk about 
our own mental health and psychosocial support issues. Am I, am I getting this correct from your presentation? Yes. <laughs> and especially in the Ukrainian, con I, I have been having worked in Ukraine a few times myself, so I can really echo what you're saying, that it's difficult for people to, especially if the word psycho gets into, or let, let alone mental health, uh, people really shy away from it uh, quite easily. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it was challenging all the time, and we had to, uh, to make a stress on the social component of PSS and rather than the psycho, uh, just to uh, involve people somehow. Uh, if pe people, I mean, beneficiaries and volunteers both. Um, yes. This is Ia speaking again, and from the chat, I'll just say that there are interesting comments. Uh, they are more general, so that I will leave them after Elfa's presentation. But just to, to mention to all of you that the uh, remote PFA, there's also an additional module on the online PFA training that all volunteers can do on remote PFA. Um, and and um, let's just uh, pass over to Elfa, and then we have more time for discussion afterwards. And Julia, you will stay on. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Alpha, if you will allow me, I'll share my screen with your presentation and yeah. then let me put it in presentation mode. And if you in the meantime could uh, perhaps introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi. I'm happy to be here with you today. I know a few names. I cannot see all of your faces, but uh, thank you for inviting me to, to speak today here with you. You can see uh, the head of my speech sharing is caring and i think it's the the crucial thing for us to share uh, information education and um, and then we have the support share the support and share the knowledge and this is a, a great platform and i would like to thank you for for organizing this webinar because this is really what we are supposed to do uh, learn from each other and and share just tell me when you want to go to the next slide. Yep, next. Uh, the information flow is, I think, really important in times like this. A lot of things was happening uh, in, a, in a speed. So uh, for people to find some safety and to find some uh, thing to grab on, you have to know what is going on at the time. So regular meetings, uh, for all staff in, in the Red Cross, the headquarters and the branches uh, were held. Also, it was, of course, important to have uh, 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 checkups and meetings in smaller units, depending on what your task was. Uh, the, uh, the aim was to get the information to everybody because the ones who were not working uh, specifically in COVID response or related to that they felt a bit left out. So that is why it's important also to, to spread information to, to others uh, who are not uh, in, in response to the COVID at the time. Uh, we opened the COVID-19 channel uh, in Teams. We have that inside of our organization. So that was also really good. Uh, people could share and ask and, and uh, put something in there if they wanted to. That, this was for the staff. And then you mean Microsoft Teams, like a, an yes. online channel, right? Yeah, okay. yeah, the channel for 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 um, for staff, and we we are uh, we were quite uh, prepared uh, in the technical part at the Icelandic Red Cross because we are used to having online meetings and we had uh, teams in place and and things like that, and that was a big plus. Also, we used our website uh, a lot. And we also have an inside web, so we could uh, share information there. Uh, it's when you think about caring for staff and volunteers. Of course, you have to have a, a good cooperation with the HR, and and uh, build on system that we have. It, it's good to remember that, uh, and you came on onto this also, um, this Bina, that uh, of course we have something in place. Uh, that's good. <laughs> so we have to remember that and build on that. But we have to also adjust because what we are used to use in some circumstances, they are not applicable to the next. So it's about the flexibility. Um, I think a, a good point for us in Iceland is that we, we have a good connection with the government, the Icelandic Red Cross role in the coordination center and in every response. 
uh, we have a, a seat there, so there's the com communication routes are shorter, so we could inform uh, our staff and, and the volunteers uh, fast. Next. This probably you have seen, and you maybe some of you just made this, but I wanted to emphasize I loved uh, a lot of materials that came out, both from the PS Center and, and IFRC uh, hand in, in, in other ways. So we uh, adjusted and translated a lot of materials from, from this site. And this is not only for beneficiaries, it's also for us. So for volunteers and staff to, um, think about these things also we we emphasize with our staff and volunteers next in in uh, staff meetings uh, and also we put this on our inner website and try to remind people of this is not only what you are supposed to encourage others to do but you're supposed to also uh, practice self-care and and don't forget that uh, in the beginning and along the way and after. Um, we did a lot of psychoeducation, uh, short stress relief education online for all staff in, in, a, in a staff meeting and, and also a shorter uh, exercises with smaller units. Uh, we had some uh, MHPSS material online and there was a special category on COVID. IS, which was a central site for everybody in the country to go to. So we had a hand on what was put in there. So that was for everyone. Uh, also frontline workers and, and um, public and, and everybody could go into this one site. I think it was in the hindsight, it was a, a crucial thing to have a central place for people to seek information. We, we took part in that, the Red Cross. Um, we had a refresh courses uh, PFA for volunteers and staff, and we had to adjust really quickly because some of our roles we didn't have before, like we had to open in a really short time a, a quarantine house. That was one of our Red Cross roles. So we had to train uh, staff and volunteers, and we had uh, good volunteers uh, in other projects that wanted to contribute to this. So that was also a good thing. but they needed to uh, have a clear uh, picture of what was their role at, at, in this uh, project. Um, yes, uh, the helpline 1717 had a big role in this response and still has. Uh, general public was uh, uh, encouraged to call the helpline for uh, advice on uh, everything and, and active listening and, and if they felt isolated, lonely, people in quarantine uh, were encouraged to call and, and things like that. So uh, the helpline's role became huge in a, a short period of time. So we had to support the st staff and volunteers there. We had to recruit really quickly uh, a lot of uh, uh, volunteers from other projects and other staff who had um, uh, changed their, uh, th their role changed because of this. So they had time. So, so we used a lot of other, other staff in other uh, projects also, but that is a challenge. How can you do this in a, in a, in a great manner and, and with quality, not everybody is equipped to, to sit down and talk to people on, on a phone in crisis. So that was also a selection part and training. So yeah, that was a lot. Um, <clears throat> we had uh, well-being calls uh, to beneficiaries, but also to uh, volunteers and staff. And that was uh, built on our uh, buddy system and uh, our peer support systems. And the manager also took part in this. Um, yeah, we have home visits. Uh, programs like many other Red Cross societies. We changed that in a rapid time to, to calls instead of visiting uh, beneficiaries, uh, you, you would call them. And that was a, a nice gesture and we have had some feedback around that, uh, that is uh, promising. Um, also, uh, 
we had uh, a practical support and, and PFA support calls to people in isolation and quarantine. And this was a cooperation with the social service. So uh, if, if there was a demand and, and they, they saw some uh, group at risks or some people that needed some extra, uh, our teams would uh, call up on them. Next. Uh, these are just a few pictures from our uh, work. Uh, these uh, volunteers at Quarantine House, they had to dress up like this and imagine to doing a PFA in, in a, a suit like this. It's really demanding and that is what uh, they have reported the volunteers who are working in this that uh, not be able to show your, um, you know, use your uh, body language and, and all of this. Uh, in this suit and, and, and giving people uh, a support that was a really uh, demanding task. Uh, what we found out is that it was good to have, a, you know, like a picture of yourself because when you cannot see the whole face, it's good to see a picture of you when you have a name, uh, name there. And we found out some ways uh, in times like these you, you uh, improvise and you do things that you didn't do before. So some of the people were doing video calls uh, just downstairs, so they didn't have all the gathering on. Sometimes it was necessary to go into the rooms. We are talking about people who were, uh, some of them were affected that were in this uh, quarantine house, but some just had to stay there in, in uh, uh, isolation or, or uh, um, quarantine because they didn't have any other place to be, like foreigners or or the circumstances at home were like that. So, yeah, and, but we had a, a, a really good feedback from the people staying there and we have had some um, nice uh, uh, thank you cards. So we have them up on the wall to remind that there were a lot of good things happening uh, in, in this. Uh, and this is a, just a picture from the, the helpline uh, and we had to recruit really fast there and there were a lot of lessons learned that we can take forward from that. Next. Anouk. Yes, I'm trying, but somehow oh, it's okay. slow. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And what is the essence of the support? Uh, and I'm thinking mostly now about just uh, the, the COVID response. What is my role now? And as uh, there's been also talked about, uh, of course, that is the essence. Uh, people have to know uh, what their roles are and it has to be clear from the side, from the management side and, and uh, all this to, to find the security in doing what you're supposed to do. Uh, how can I meet these demands? People have to have some answers regarding that. Uh, how will I manage the stress level? Do I have some uh, techniques that I can use? Are there any te technical issues? Do I have everything that I need for the job? And all of the things that uh, are important, of course, uh, all the time, but extremely important now because uh, some of the tasks are really uh, high, high in risk. So you have to feel secure in what you're doing. Uh, and. Uh, it has to be clear where to seek support if needed. Clear message from management level about working hours and, and what is uh, asked of you. We have peer support in place, so we could uh, draw on that. And I was really thankful for, for that was up and running at the time. Um, we also prompted well-being calls from managers to frontline workers. Uh, and we had uh, a supervision online for smaller units and we just we took um, it was um, the most 10 to 15 in each group uh, on an online uh, supervision and it was just like this on uh, zoom or in teams so we used uh, used that I personally prefer uh, face to face uh, in present uh, gatherings, but this was better than nothing. And uh, if we think about what Ea was referring to, it's about the connection. So it also happens through the web. So uh, 
I think that is something that we will also use when we have to. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there were also in place private supervision and people were using that. We have it inside our organization and also we have contractors that we can refer to psychologists outside uh, if needed. Uh, the group supervision was uh, uh, used uh, for many groups and in the, the most demanding project at the time we had the group supervision uh, every week and sometimes every two weeks. They decided, the group themselves, what was applicable for them, but they had the opportunity and could ask for that. Uh, also, we uh, encouraged uh, staff and volunteers to use the helpline. They could also do that uh, if they wanted. Next. Uh, the aftermath, uh, what happens after a, a time of crisis and you have feel like you've been running a, a marathon, uh, you need to rest. And what was decided that HR, that all staff for the Red Cross could ta take one day off, uh, it was not, uh, um, it was just for all, not especially for the, those who were in the in the response, but everybody, and were encouraged to take a, a long weekend and combine it with some some other holidays, so so it could be a longer time. That was just a, a, a gesture and appreciation uh, for the staff, and it was well, uh, people liked that. Frontline workers decided with their manager regarding longer rest because, as we have seen, if you have been in a, a first response in a front line in a crisis like this, you have to take a break afterwards. Uh, appreciation to volunteers, a thank you letter for those who uh, took really big part in the response and, and everybody got a voucher at the hotel and that was really nice because people are not coming as much here and traveling, as you know, all around the world. So we could use this opportunity to offer our volunteers uh, a gesture like this. And that, that was really well appreciated. So they can choose a time when they, they can go. Uh, of course, in this, it's always uh, lessons learned, positive and negative. Uh, and we are still working on that, actually, uh, you know, trying to uh, gather information and data from uh, many places to take together and, and hopefully one day I can present that <laughs> later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elva. And let me stop sharing my screen. Uh, that was very interesting. Very good to hear from you. I'm, I just am a bit mindful of time. We have four minutes left officially on this webinar. For me, it's not a problem to go a bit over time, but we would understand if participants on the call need to leave. So. Uh, please, if you need to leave, just leave a message in the chat and then um, and log off. Uh, and thank you so much for participating. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, and we do wondering... have uh, yeah, we do have a couple of very interesting comments to what has been presented. And and I'd like to invite you, Chaim, first, because you have been working and and uh, as Elfa talked about the people in quarantine houses, but you have been giving special support to staff that were in quarantine. Would you say a bit about that? Yes, uh, thank you. It's about staff and volunteers. It's not just uh, uh, staff. Uh, Sorry. Uh, just to say that uh, Magen David Adom uh, is the national ambulance provider in Israel. And uh, from the very beginning, we were uh, deeply involved in sampling people uh, who were at home quarantine. Um, and uh, besides that, uh, we had, uh, uh, and I have to say that most of the cases uh, that went to quarantine were not work-related, were uh, community-related. So uh, people uh, were, were in uh, contact with uh, people that uh, later became uh, positive, and that's another interesting discussion about uh, our capacity to be uh, extremely cautious when we are doing the work um, paid or not paid, it doesn't matter, and we uh, follow very strict uh, rules about uh, personal protective equipment and hygiene. But when we are in uh, the social setting, we are not that cautious. 
another very interesting discussion, not for now. I just want to share the experience uh, we had uh, for our staff and volunteers who were uh, in quarantine. We open WhatsApp groups. Uh, to say that uh, in Israel, WhatsApp is the main way uh, of uh, communication. Um, people actually pride themselves about the number of uh, WhatsApp groups uh, they uh, are member of, and uh, if you don't have at least 20 or 30 different WhatsApp groups, you are no one. Um, and very early we decided that uh, we will open for uh, each, uh, we call it regions, this is the way we, we are organized, um, a, a dedicated WhatsApp group uh, with the idea that first of all people uh, in uh, quarantine feel very lonely. And sometimes the day becomes night and night becomes a day and uh, Others are in the same situation, so it was a place where they could share at uh, 2 a.m. in the morning uh, messages like, guys, there is a very nice film uh, going on on this uh, channel on TV, or uh, I just found this series, or, or whatever. Uh, for those who live alone, it was a way of exchanging interesting recipes for new things to cook. Um, the feedback they gave us is that it made their loneliness uh, easier, especially because they were sharing with people who were in the exact same situation and uh, felt the same. Uh, people in quarantine uh, felt like, uh, sorry for my military terms, uh, like they deserted the battle. That their friends are out there uh, doing the harsh and uh, sometimes dangerous work, and they are and they are not part of it. So uh, it it was something that uh, we all understand. Uh, you can share with a peer, uh, your family and friends outside of Magen David Adom will never understand that the kind of uh, why these crazy people uh, would rather be on harm's way instead of being in the safety of their homes. Um, it was shared a lot a lot of uh, black humor, laughters, and um, we were part of that group because it was also their uh, channel to communicate uh, questions, um, very serious questions from time to time about the disease, about their chances of uh, suffering from complications, and uh, about administrative issues like uh, their sick leave, their uh, medical permits, and, and things like that. And it was a very nice way for us because we were invited to the group uh, to monitor and, and see that they are uh, okay. And from time to time, uh, send a personal message to someone who, whom we haven't seen on the group for two or three days. And quarantine, of course, is 14 days just to send a private message, say, hey, are you okay? Do you need, uh, do you need anything? Uh, my last comment about people in quarantine is that, um, and it is for us part of uh, PS, PSS, is uh, the idea that people in quarantine uh, sometimes needed a very simple technical things. Uh, like, for example, uh, at the beginning of the outbreak in Israel, the use of masks was not mandatory. Uh, but uh, people who were under home quarantine uh, were asked um, to wear masks when they are leaving the room and going to the common uh, areas uh, at home, for example, like to the bathroom. And people didn't have uh, masks, surgical masks at home, did not want to send uh, their family members to buy for them. Also, it was difficult to get them. And of course, for MDA, who had many of those masks, it was not an issue. But it was just paying the, the attention that there is a need, we can cover it, it's easy to cover. And uh, people were uh, very appreciative about that. At the same time, from time to time, we had to say, hey, guys, uh, this is something that we are not going to cover. And uh, there was a thin line uh, over there. Um, I, I think... Uh, we managed to meet most of the of the technical uh, things, uh, sometimes funny things like I ran out of coffee, uh, which is which is okay. And uh, I, I think that the most important thing was to give people the feeling that we care, that we are there, and uh, for simple daily things. Uh, and and we have a lot of young. Uh, staff and volunteers who live alone and uh, you can imagine that uh, being at home for 14 days not having coffee becomes an issue yeah. and uh, if we can provide you with a coffee and sugar why not
Yeah. Thank it's you. It's PFA. It is yeah. PFA. It's just, like, uh, it's just like Elfa said, it's the small thing that counts. So thank you very much, Chaim. And uh, as Anouk said, we can go a bit over time because um, I also wanted to give the word to Numi. And thank you, Chaim. That was interesting. Uh, Numi, are you still there? Unmute yourself if you are. Maybe you had to leave. If not, I'll just I don't, ask. I don't see her in the participation list anymore. All right, so she, she was there, but that, there was a yes. comment by her early on that you may have seen that what they did is they started having this call line in Niger where trained volunteers and interns called uh, people, um, the volunteers in the field, and that after some time it really became a body system. That was just a small comment. And Patricia, you've been mentioned, that you've been, um, people talked about, because you mentioned that the ICSC do have a special training program for staff. Um, are you there, Patricia? I can see you on mute. Yes, I am here. Hello. Ah, very good. Nice to hear you. You don't have much time. Just say a bit about whether this program is available for everybody. There's been questions and if you think it works. Yeah. In this moment, I can say I am a training of both in English country and in French country in Western North Africa. My colleagues in the other part of the world, all for our staff, both mobile staff and local staff. It's working well because our staff needed to we are present to explaining what is ongoing for them because a lot of them are in, in a really incredible situation in general that the COVID uncertainty bring more, a lot of stress more. And also we started to have a case of a colleague affected by COVID or in quarantine. Yes, the program is working. A lot of people ask to participate. In general, it is a, it's a clear that it's a psychoeducation program. It's a you know, group session. We do also group session. We do, we do also individual session. And we, we follow up for mental health, uh, psychosocial support to the colleague uh, the, that are in quarantine. But with this program, the people we are uh, uh, training, they will participate personally and they can have the material to share the information in their delegation. So they become also facilitator. So the first we start to training our health staff, our mental health PSS operational, and in general, our ombudsman, because it's the people who usually the staff call when they are in need. Mm. So yeah, it's working. Oh. I will. I will be happy. We are. We are doing also a study. Uh, RCRC in Geneva will get all the information on the survival. We will propose a survival at the beginning, a survival at the end to monitoring the situation and to have a, um, a study at the end that is Geneva to do that. And, uh, but, yeah. Okay, but Patricia, is it an open source document that you can find uh, on the ICSC website? People are asking about that. This is the last question. Yeah, it's important. It's an internal document for the moment, but I, okay. I, I will uh, propose to share it with you because we have a, a common strategy. Yeah. So, but I, I said that you lost the time because you can just look at the material and find the ideas. It's not, uh, I, you know, I am a to all people in our organization, or they will get the material. So it's really public. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's, it's not open source, but it's uh, circulating. Let's conclude it as this. And Anouk, I will leave the floor to you because uh, now we need to final, um, to end the seminar. And there are more comments, but we don't have time for them. But thank you also from my side. I'll mute myself and, and check out with you. Yes. Thank you so much, Aya, and to all speakers. And I think uh, the fact that we go over time goes to show there's, uh, yeah, even in, uh, in, in June in this pandemic, there's even so much more to discuss when it comes to mental health and psychosocial support and caring for staff and volunteers. And we will have these issues for time to come. So. Uh, keep a look out on the, the PS Center website and Facebook pages. We will announce more of these types of events, both in the European region and beyond. And I would uh, like to give a very warm welcome to my co-host, uh, A.S. Susan Akasha from the PS Center, um, Berta from the IFRC Regional European Office, 
and obviously our great presenters, Despina, Yulia, and Alpha, from, uh, uh, who just had such great presentations. And I'd like to thank all of you for your great participation and hopefully see you at the next webinar we'll organize. Thank you so much and have a great day. And for your information, um, the, the presenters will stay on. We will have a little debrief how it went and the rest of you can check out. <laughs>